Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as Barb mentioned, today we begin a journey through the gospel or the good news of Jesus according to John. This journey will take us all the way through Easter as together we explore how the gospel writer John narrates Jesus' life to achieve John's stated purpose. As John himself writes at the end of his gospel, John narrates Jesus' life as he does so that readers may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing may have life in Jesus' name. In other words, John has big plans for his gospel. So a quick bit of background before we dive in. John's gospel was likely written sometime between or around 90 to 110 of the common era, era, making it the last of the four gospels we have in the Bible to be written. Its first audience was likely a mixed group of early followers of Christ, some from the Jewish tradition and some from the non-Jewish or Gentile tradition. And perhaps most notably, in comparison to the Gospels written by the authors we call Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John is by far the most unique. John has a lot more theology or God talk, explanations of what things mean than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. That being said, as we will see, while John does a fair bit of interpreting, John's interpretations often need their own interpreting. John's gospel is full of moments when he seems to be seek, speaking on both a storytelling and a spiritual meaning level at the same time. Our scripture today contains vivid examples of this double speak. So picture with me the scene as today's scripture reading begins. Two followers of a teacher named John, whom we in the church commonly call John the Baptist, are gathered around near the Jordan where John has been baptizing to hear his teachings. And then Jesus walks by. So John exclaims, look, here is the Lamb of God. Just the day before, John had made an ex a similar ex ex exclamation when Jesus appeared and that at that time offered a longer explanation, even calling Jesus the Son of God. Yet while John's testimony and endorsement, if you will, of Jesus the following, the previous day, seemingly didn't provoke a response from the disi these disciples, on this particular day, having heard this exclamation again, things are different. Perhaps John's followers had been contemplating overnight what he had said, or perhaps their curiosity just gets the best of them. Either way, this time when John says, look at this guy, here is the Lamb of God, off they go. These two followers, students of John, take off to follow Jesus. Now, we don't know how long or how closely they trailed Jesus, but at some point, Jesus turns and sees that these two people are following him. And so he says to them, what are you looking for? As Dr. J Amy Jill Levine points out, what are you looking for is on the surface a natural question to ask when one discovers that one is being followed. But on another level, it is a reference to a spiritual search, to a longing and quest to find that which will bring hope and comfort to one's spirit. And in classic Gospel of John fashion, the writer John likely hopes that we will begin to see Jesus 
as the one who can fulfill spiritual desires, even though these two people before Jesus have yet to recognize Jesus as such. As we begin our journey through John's gospel and continue leaning into 2022, which has already had more than its fair share of twists and turns, what are you looking for? Is also a great question for us all to consider. Jesus' invitation to name needs and longings extends even to us. What are we looking for? What are we longing for? What do our spirits need most in these tender, uncertain, challenging days? My list is long. <laughs> I barely know where to begin most days. I seek stability, peace, wholeness for myself and for all. I seek strength and patience to persevere in kindness and compassion amid strife and self-interest. I long for signs that the moral universe is indeed bending towards justice as was boldly proclaimed by the abolitionist preacher Theodore Parker, and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whom our nation remembers this weekend. But how would I sum that all up if I were asked? I don't have a clue. <laughs> Put on the spot, I'd likely start babbling or avoid answering altogether, perhaps by responding to Jesus with a question of my own as did the two people in today's scripture. These two who have been trailing Jesus respond to Jesus' initial question by asking in return, where are you staying? Their question is another classic example of Gospel of John doublespeak, perhaps even more obvious than the doublespeak in Jesus' question. For asking someone where they are staying is an act, isn't exactly a logical response to the question, what are you looking for? In the original Greek text, the word translated as stay can also be translated as abide. So more than just asking where Jesus is laying his head or lodging, these two ask Jesus, a very spiritual question about where he is making his spiritual home. Where are, you, where are you staying becomes where are you abiding? They ask Jesus in essence, where does your spirit rest? Where is your spirit centered or grounded? In response, Jesus offers not information, but an invitation. Come and see. Come and see. With those words, Jesus invites his first followers to learn more about him, to have their spiritual longings fulfilled through personal experience, and in good time. Not all at once. In contrast with the often told call of the disciples' stories in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus says, follow me, and those called immediately leave seemingly everything behind and follow Jesus without further questions, Jesus, come and see in John's Gospel is more invitational than directive welcoming curiosity and wonderings, asking only for a bit of time and observation, for starters, rather than a sudden whole life change right from day one. In this way, I think John's telling of Jesus' first interaction with his eventual disciples is much closer to most human experience. Sure, there very well may have been people and may still be some who suddenly drop everything and completely change their lives in an instant to follow Jesus. 
But that's not me, nor most people I know. I'm a come and see Jesus follower. By taking me to worship from a young age, welcoming me to serve alongside them, praying with and for me, sharing personal stories of God's presence through joy and struggle, people throughout my life have invited me to come and see who Jesus is, what Jesus is all about, and how following Jesus' example of love, welcome, justice, peace, and mercy lead to transformation and bring hope and wholeness. As I saw and experienced Jesus in and through others, I wanted to come and see more and more. And over time, that led me, as it led those first two disciples long ago, to want to invite others to come and see, to come and experience for themselves the transformation, hope, and wholeness found by following Jesus' ways in the world. Come and see. It's easy to make a life of faith more complicated than that, but it needn't be. Jesus' first invitation still rings true each time we come longing searching for something. Again and again, Jesus invites us and all to come and see who Jesus is and where Jesus abides as people and communities help outcasts find belongings, meet the hurting with compassion, seek wholeness for those who are ill, comfort the brokenhearted, feed the hungry, and lean hard on the moral arc of the universe, helping to bend it toward justice. Jesus invites us to come and see. And once we've seen for ourselves and know for ourselves, however long that seeing and knowing takes, ours is then the privilege, honor, and joy to do as those first disciples did in, and invite others to come and see for themselves too. May God give us eyes and hearts to see and the courage and conviction to keep the invitations flowing. To God be the glory. Amen.